I am Groot. 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 Colton Himmel. Nailed. Testing, testing, one, two. Okay. We're back. Sorry about that. As I was saying, how you doing, everybody? Today we're going to take a quick look at Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Written and directed by James Gunn and starring Chris Pratt, Chuck Woody, Iwuji, I hope I got that name at least close, and the voice of Bradley Cooper. The Guardian's headquarters on Nowhere is suddenly attacked by Adam Warlock, played by Will Bolter, whose appearance was teased at the end of Volume 2. They manage to fight him off, but Rocket is gravely injured during the fight, and they can't heal him due to his cybernetic implants unless they can find a way to disable his kill switch. And so the Guardians go on a quest to save their friend, which takes them to the psychopath who created him, the High Evolutionary, played by Awuji. And through it all, we get flashbacks into Rocket's past, and boy, that poor little raccoon has seen some shit. I very much enjoyed the first two Guardians movies, and this one did not disappoint, although Gunn did do a few different things this time around. This is definitely the darkest Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Quill has become a horribly depressed alcoholic after the death of Gamora, which is compounded by the fact that Gamora is technically still alive, although it's not the Gamora he knew. Mourning someone who's dead is bad enough. Mourning someone who is technically still alive has got to be one hell of a mindfuck. And it was interesting watching Star-Lord go through every stage of grief throughout the course of the movie, and Pratt played the part very well. And a large part of the story focuses on Rocket and how he came to be Rocket. And I did not think I would get so many feels out of the story of a genetically and cybernetically modified raccoon, but here we are. But then if anyone could pull that off, it's James Gunn. He has a talent for getting strong emotional reactions out of the silliest shit. And I don't know if this was intentional, but the High Evolutionary's experiments kind of feels like a commentary on AI-generated art. The High Evolutionary's whole thing is that he is trying to create the perfect life form. And in so doing, he ends up creating various creatures, mostly humanoid, who can perform super complicated tasks in record time. But even though they can perform tasks faster and more efficiently than any non-genetically modified life form, they can only do what they are taught. They have no innovation, no creativity. Literally all they can do is follow instructions. And that is why the High Evolutionary is so obsessed with Rocket. He's the one that got away. Out of all of his creations, Rocket is the only one who exhibited actual honest-to-God intelligence. The story also shows the futility of trying to create a perfect society. Humanity is imperfect by nature, and trying to make it otherwise will always end in failure. That doesn't mean we can't strive to be better than we are. There's always room for improvement, but perfection is inherently unattainable. Nothing is perfect. And that's okay. And during Rocket's various flashbacks, while he is mostly dead, we meet several other animals that the High Evolutionary experimented on. There's an otter named Lila, a walrus named Teefs, and a rabbit named Floor. She chose that name because she was on the floor. Again, not much in the way of creativity. And if you've already seen this movie, you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, I have to warn you, there are moments in this movie where you will not be okay. All of the heartstrings will be tugged by these genetically modified animals. But even though the movie has a tendency to get dark and a bit sad at times, the usual Guardians of the Galaxy silliness is still there. Drax the Destroyer still does not understand how metaphors work. He's trying, bless him. And we get to see a very different side of Drax in this movie. I don't want to spoil too much, but it, it was unexpected and yet it kind of worked. Batista is honestly starting to impress me. I don't think many people could have pulled off this character as well as he. Mantis is still delightfully weird. One moment that sticks out is when the Guardians are doing a spacewalk, and most of them are moving very carefully and deliberately in this zero-g environment, and then there's Mantis in the background just spinning wildly through space. And honestly, I couldn't really tell if that was deliberate or if she was genuinely out of control. Based on that character, I could see it going either way. Groot is still Groot. We love Groot. And I got a kick out of Gamora's reaction to Groot because this is not the Gamora who met Groot in the first two movies, so she has no idea that he actually 
can communicate when he says, I am Groot. She's convinced the other Guardians are just pretending he's actually saying something. No, they're not, Gamora. No, they're not. I really liked Bolter as Adam Warlock, probably the most tunnel vision supervillain. They did wake him up before he was done cooking, so, you know, there are a few bugs in the system. And we got a lot more Cosmo in this movie, which is great. And I did not realize until I saw her name in the credits that it was Maria Bakalova doing the voice. After Borat's subsequent movie film, I'm happy to see her in anything, and the banter between her and Kraglin was hilarious. And we got another Howard the Duck cameo, because why not? The soundtrack was pretty good overall, but not quite what I was expecting. Volume 1 mainly focused on the 70s and Volume 2 on the 80s, so I figured Volume 3 would be mainly 90s. And I think I counted two songs in the soundtrack that are actually from the 90s. There's an acoustic version of Creep and, of course, In the Meantime, which was featured in the trailer, but that's it, I think. Still a good selection overall, just not what I was expecting. And I did not expect to see two Chris Pratt movies in as many months with No Sleep Till Brooklyn in the soundtrack, but here we are. Speaking of, that action sequence in particular was so well done. It's shot as if it's all one take, which of course it isn't, and if you're paying attention you can see where the cuts are, but still, it looks amazing. Overall, I enjoyed this very much, highly recommended. If you were a fan of the first two movies, you probably already saw this opening weekend, but if you haven't, you must. And the movie does have mid- and post credit scenes indicating we may not be done with Star-Lord or the Guardians of the Galaxy, even if they may take on a different form in the future. And that's all I have to say about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Till next time, take care.